Good morning, friends. Good morning, friends here in the chapel who made it through the rain. And good morning, friends at home in your gym jams with your coffee and your Cocoa Pops. We're going to um, take some time now to worship the Lord and to remind ourselves why we're here. Um, so if you're watching on at home, I um, invite you to praise along either with your voices or with your hearts as you join us in worship. We're going to sing Here I Am to Worship. Those in the congregation here can stand pleased to sing. Almighty and loving God, we thank you for revealing your son Jesus in glory before he suffered and died. Give us faith to recognise him as your dear son and strengthen us to suffer with him until we come to share his glory. For he lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Good morning and welcome to everyone worshipping with us in the chapel and also to those at home. So today's Transfiguration Sunday, the day when we think about brightness and light. So it's a bit odd when you look outside. Um, 
but we'll, as you'll see the theme of light come through in our songs and readings during this morning. We continue with our COVID restrictions. Um, this is the last Sunday that we'll need to wear masks, I think. So one step further. Um, we will have morning tea, but we'll probably serve it in the foyer here. Um, we don't have a big crowd in, so we should all be able to fit in there. For our children's ministries, um, because chapel classrooms are set up for some scholarship exams, there won't be any under five singing this morning. But um, other older children, I guess it might be best for you to meet in the foyer and, um, after communion and see what you're doing from there. Thanks to the choir who will be singing today, singing the anthem in between the readings. If today's transfiguration, that means we're coming up to Lent. So firstly, that means we'll be changing our banners today from white to purple. So if you're available immediately after the service to help with that, that would be good. We have our Ash Wednesday service. Um, this coming Wednesday at 7 o'clock here in the chapel, and then we'll have Lenten devotions every Wednesday at the same time through Lent. Ruby's, our um, ladies' ministry is on, or ladies' Bible study, is on the first Saturday of every month, so that means it's coming up um, this coming Saturday. After the meeting, we have... After the service, we have a go-to meeting to discuss what they're doing coming up. So just look out for Steve. He'll be hiding. Well, he won't be hiding. He'll be visible somewhere. Um, and look, today we have Andreas, who's helping us lead the liturgy, and Kerry, who's giving us a message, and a new boy in the band. So be kind to him. Um, Steve's got some announcements about helping hands. So I'll ask Steve to come up. Thanks, Neil. Straight after the service today, we'll be having a go-to and a helping hands meeting. Um, it's not good weather for it, but um, we need to discuss the catering for next week's evening service, return, return to the helping hands van, and how go-to and helping hands will be involved in the LLL um, centenary lunch celebration. With the new chaplain who will be overseeing Redeemer's commitment to the van, not starting till second term, the two-can appeal that normally runs in first term has not gone ahead. So with demand for groceries still being really high, our shelves have been looking a bit depleted and bare. We've done two really large shops in the past month and a half, which has kept us going. Now, a lot of you support the van, but don't get to go out on it. So I'd just like to share our experience last Friday night. It was a pretty dismal lot night to go out on the van, and a couple of of the people from the second stop had rang me concerned for our safety and actually going out in them conditions. I assured, assured them that it would be all right, and even though it wasn't very inviting, we would be there. Now, our van was even less impressed and wouldn't even start. <laughs> so, But we've only missed two nights over the last seven years the vans ran, and that was due to a short notice on COVID lockdowns. I think it's really people like Jerry that make it imperative that the van goes out every week. Jenny, Jerry used to come down to the van with the aid of his carers, but due to cuts in funding, they finish early on a Fridays and therefore they don't even prepare his even, evening meal. Jerry rely, relies on us to bring him sandwiches and food and a cup of tea to his unit and he hungry gets started eating them as soon as we arrive. Now, he's a Christian guy who just about confined to a small unit all the time. So each week, I get to take a five-minute break from the van and sit in his large armchair and just chat with him. He's a really nice guy. So without the yellow van, Cole and I piled everything into his um, Kia people mover. We prayed for safety and a fulfilling night. And at both housing commission stops, people were waiting for us under umbrellas. We still gave out 20 loaves of bread, um, homemade meals, and the same amount of groceries as usual. But what made the most impression on us 
was when I received a phone call on the way home from Ross Walbrook about seeing a homeless guy at, on Newman Road for the past three days. I got directions from him and as we approached, we saw a guy what, on a, under a large umbrella with a trolley just on the side of the road. Now, we didn't, didn't have a, any um, van to give him any hot food. But we did have a loaf of bread and we had plenty of cans of food. And I know he was grateful for that. And also, that's, I think that someone would go out of their way and turn, go and see him. On the home, way home, we were thinking, yes, we were wet and uncomfortable, but what about him? We'll be home in an hour's time, having a cup of coffee or a glass of wine. This guy will still be out there in the rain, waiting for the service station to close so he can get a little bit of shelter. So the 15 to $20 worth of groceries won't change your situation that night. But the groceries you give us may give us the opportunity for someone to experience an act of Christian love with no strings attached. So I just thank you for your ongoing support and also your continuing donations of food items that have enabled this ministry. Thank you. Let me add my welcome to the service this Sunday. Well, I'll let Jack figure out the levels to get me that. And welcome to those who are joining us from home. Uh, this is a Sunday where we come with some uncertainty, perhaps, with war declared on Ukraine, uh, with flooding here in Brisbane. Uh, but it's also Transfiguration Sunday, uh, the Sunday before Lent, where we recognise that Jesus is both God and an ordinary human, that Jesus gets the messiness, the uncertainty of life, but he's also the one who now is sitting up in heaven in control of everything, uh, so we can trust him. And in today's gospel reading, we're going to hear the story of Jesus' transfiguration, uh, where even here as a human, he reveals his glory, his divine light to the disciples. Uh, and so, as Neil said, we're going to pick up on that light imagery this Sunday. So let's continue our worship in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, speak with me the litany of transfiguration. When I am tempted to look only at my faults, let me see only Jesus. When troubled by the spectre of doubt and defeat, let me see only Jesus. When I can't see beyond the frustrations of the moment, let me see only Jesus. When the horizon seems distant and dark, let me see only Jesus. When I can't see the point of pursuing what's good, let me see only Jesus. When complaining and cynicism invade my peace, let me see only Jesus. When I can't face my problems, let me see only Jesus. When the world looks bleak, let me see only Jesus. When others measure and judge me, let me see only Jesus. When beset by depression, let me see only Jesus. When friendship is far from me, let me see only Jesus. When overshadowed by sorrow, let me see only Jesus. When I fail to use my freedom, let me see only Jesus. When it's hard to forgive, let me see only Jesus. When things don't make sense, let me see only Jesus. When I think I can't change, let me see only Jesus. When confronted by suffering, let me see only Jesus. When stress gets me down, let me see only Jesus. When it's hard to go on, let me see only Jesus. When blinded by sin, let me see only Jesus. 
When the hardness of life overwhelms me, let me see only Jesus. When hope begins to fade, let me see only Jesus. Amen. We'll hear from the Bible now. Today's reading from the Old Testament comes from the book of Exodus, after Moses descends from meeting God on the mountaintop. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai, carrying the two stone tablets inscribed with the terms of the covenant, he wasn't aware that his face had become radiant because he had spoken to the Lord. So when Aaron and the people of Israel saw the radiance of Moses' face, they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called out to them and asked Aaron and all the leaders of the community to come over, and he talked with them. Then all the people of Israel approached him, and Moses gave them all the instructions the Lord had given him on Mount Sinai. When Moses finished speaking with them, he covered his face with a veil. But whenever he went into the tent of meeting to speak with the Lord, he would remove the veil until he came out again. Then he would give the people whatever instructions the Lord had given him, and the people of Israel would see the radiant glow of his face. So he would put the veil over his face until he returned to speak with the Lord. Our response, arise, shine, for your light has come. Today's Gospel reading comes from the book of Luke, chapter 9, verses 28 to 36. Please stand for the Gospel reading. About eight days later, Jesus took Peter, John and James up on a mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was transformed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared and began talking with Jesus. They were glorious to see, and they were speaking about his exodus from this world, which was about to be fulfilled in Jerusalem. Peter and the others had fallen asleep When they woke up, they saw Jesus' glory and the two men standing with him. 
As Moses and Elijah were starting to leave, Peter, not even knowing what he was saying, blurted out, Master, it's wonderful for us to be here. Let's make three shelters as memorials, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. But even as he was saying this, a cloud overshadowed them, and terror gripped them as the cloud covered them. Then a voice from the cloud said, this is my son, my chosen one, listen to him. When the voice finished, Jesus was there alone. They didn't tell anyone at that time what they had seen. And our response, arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. My lighthouse now. Um, and I'm thinking we get a bit controversial. Ask the kids to come up now if you're keen to do some actions to my lighthouse with our chief kid, Emma, um, who's going to help you with some actions. So if you want to come up and do the actions now, that's fine. If not, come charging up at the end of the song for the children's message. Okay, great. Let's go. In my
That was a great job. Well done, everybody. Come on up, kids. Do you think we might talk about lighthouses for a little while, hey? Yeah, take a seat. I'll get a seat too. Has anybody seen a lighthouse lately? No? You've never seen a lighthouse? Oh, you are missing out. Something wonderful. They are these really big, tall things, buildings, and they sit on the edge of rocks overlooking the ocean. And what they do is they shine their light, big light, all the way out to the ocean at night time, sometimes during the day if it's a stormy day, so the ships can see where the land is. Because sometimes ships out on the ocean, they just get bamboozled. They get upset with the weather and everything and they come charging in and run onto the rocks and then they sink. So they put these lighthouses. There's one down in northern New South Wales. Get mum and dad to take you for a drive. It's really cool. You can walk all the way up the steps up to the top of the lighthouse and look out into the ocean and see where it is. There it is. That's the very lighthouse. And see, it's right on the top near the ocean and the lights are on so that the ships can see where the land is. Now, why am I telling you all this? Because we have something too. Can I have two people to hold this up for me? Yes, come on up, quick, quick, quick. We have something, do you, you can come there. <laughs> Thank you very much. When you get a little bit taller, that'll be great. We have something that God gave us a long, long time ago that we can use like a lighthouse as well. Does anybody have any idea what they look like? You can yell out from the audience too, yes. They're the Ten Commandments. Yes, a long time ago. These aren't actually the Ten Commandments. But a while ago, my husband Ross made them for me because I gave this talk a few years ago. And he made them and he actually wrote the Ten Commandments on there in the language that they used, except for the one down the bottom. Turn it up. Can anybody read what this says here? It's a bit hard. He was a bit tricky and he said, Levi was here. <laughs> now, that's not really biblical, but that's what Mr. Ross is like. He's a bit funny at times. So we have the Ten Commandments and the Ten Commandments are there like a lighthouse for us. They tell us what we can do and how we can do them and they come straight from God. Moses was given these by God. And in our readings today, we talked about Moses having the Ten Commandments and he used these to teach his people what God wanted them to do and how, they want, how God wanted them to be. Maybe when you go home today and maybe over lunch or morning tea, whichever comes first, you can talk to your parents and ask them about the Ten Commandments and they might show them to you in the Bible, because they're written in the Bible, the Ten Commandments. They don't actually look like this, but they're in the Bible, so you might be able to see that. What do you think? Yes. It's a rainy day. Why not read the Bible? Yeah. Okay, let's pray. Thank you, girls. You've done a great job. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have given us Things like this, the Ten Commandments, to be our lighthouse, to read them, to know what we can do, to find out how much you love us and care for us. We thank you, Lord, that there are lots of things in the world that are there that you've created for us to keep us safe. We thank you for our parents and for our grandparents and all our friends who love us and keep us safe, Lord. Thank you for the rain, Lord, but you've done enough now. And I think we've got enough rain happening. So thank you, Lord. It's time to stop. Um, 
And all God's people said, Amen. Okie dokie, you can go back to your seats now. Good morning, everybody. Today is Transfiguration Sunday. It's a day we celebrate something really it's exciting and wonderful. They actually call it a festival. And probably overseas in um, some European com- countries, they do actually have a festival-like ceremony. It's the last Sunday in the Epiphanies, and now we are getting ready for Lent. We've seen Christ's glory as the incarnate Son of God being manifested throughout the Epiphany season. He was a baby and then he was a boy. And beginning with the visit of the wise men on Epiphany itself. At the baptism of our Lord, Jesus' Messiahship, if that's a word, was attested and affirmed by the Holy Spirit descending on him in the form of a dove. And the voice of the Father from heaven saying, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. Then we saw Jesus at the wedding at Cana providing new wine, the very best wine for the new covenant he was establishing. In the Nazareth synagogue, Jesus read a prophecy of the Messiah to come and declared, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And in his ministry, we have seen Jesus doing just that, proclaiming good news, setting at liberty those who are oppressed and healing the sick. Now, today, the Epiphany season reaches its climax. It is the transfiguration of our Lord, that momentous occasion when Jesus was manifested in his glory as God's son before his disciples, Peter, James and John. Now Moses and Elijah, they make a showing to make clear that Jesus is the one that they were pointing ahead to. And once again, the voice of Father comes, this is my son, my chosen one, listen to him. It truly is a mountaintop experience. But today I want you to notice that this is not only about the transfiguration of our Lord, it is also about his exodus. Don't worry, I'll explain what Exodus means. And we'll also see how this relates to us. And so our theme this morning is Transfiguration and Exodus of our Lord. Our text is the Holy Gospel for this day from Luke chapter 9. Matthew, Mark and Luke all record this event of Jesus' transformation. And there are many things in common among the three accounts, obviously. It's the basic story. But each one may have a distinctive way to describe something or bring in a detail that other accounts do not have. Such is the case today with Luke's narrative. All of the accounts tell us that the Old Testament figures of Moses Moses and Elijah were standing alongside Jesus, talking with him. But only Luke tells us what they were talking about. And this is where we get to the matter of Exodus, Jesus' Exodus. When we hear the word Exodus, we naturally think of Moses, and rightly so. We even call the second book of Moses Exodus, because that's where we read about the Exodus event. The Exodus of the people of Israel from Egypt, brought about by the Lord God under the leadership of Moses. And that's really the big story of the Old Testament. It's God's signature act of deliverance. In Israel's history, to bring people out of slavery in Egypt and up into the Promised Land. So what does this have to do with transfiguration and with Jesus and his supposed exodus? When I read the Gospel yesterday, And when you read it, you probably didn't see the word Exodus anywhere in the text. But you do. It's just hidden under the English words. 
We, we saw where it says, and behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory. Okay, so far, so good. Nothing new here, nothing different from what we find in Matthew or Mark. But then Luke adds this detail, telling us what Moses and Elijah were talking with Jesus about. It's in verse 31 where it says that, spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. They spoke of Jesus' departure. Guess what the Greek word here is for departure? Anybody want to guess? Exodus. Good on you. You are listening. Moses and Elijah were talking with Jesus about his exodus. That is, his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now, what kind of sense does that make? How is Jesus going to accomplish an exodus? What does it mean by his departure? And what does that mean for us? Well, the word exodus literally means the way out. Moses led the children of Israel on the way out of their slavery in Egypt. And if we look at the story of the exodus, that way out, we will begin to understand how Jesus would accomplish an even greater exodus for us. Okay, so the people of Israel were in slavery, in bondage, and they couldn't get out. Pharaoh and the Egyptians had control over them. There was no escape, no way out. This parallel is a parallel to our situation. We are in bondage, well we were in bondage, in slavery, slaves to sin and death and the devil. Satan had control on us. We were in his domain and there was no way out. We were trapped, stuck in our sins, lost and condemned sinners, with only the grave and hell waiting before us. And so it would remain unless God intervened. The Lord God did intervene with the Israelites. God in his mercy remembered his covenant he made with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And it came down and visited his people to redeem them, to set them free. He called Moses to do the job. In an even greater way, God sent his own son, Jesus Christ, to do the redeeming, the setting free job, not just for Israel, but for the whole world. Our Lord Jesus Christ came down from heaven for us, for all our salvation. He is the one greater than Moses anointed and appointed to do even greater work. This is my son, my chosen one, the Father says of Jesus. Now how would this redeeming work be done? How would the setting free be accomplished? With Israel, it happened over the Passover. After a series of plagues, the Lord finally sent the angel of death throughout Egypt to strike down the firstborn in every home. And the homes of the Israelites would not have been spared except for one thing. The Lord provided a way out, an escape, a way for death to pass over their homes. God told Moses to tell the Israelites to take a lamb without blemish, to sacrifice it, and to spread the blood of the lamb on the doorposts of their homes as a sign for death to pass over. And so it was. Now, in a far surprising way, Jesus himself is the Passover lamb by which our lives are spared. His holy blood marks us as those spared from death. Jesus is the perfect sacrifice without any spot or blemish of sin. And yet, he dies in our place, shedding his blood on the wood of the cross, marking us as forgiven. God sees Christ's holy blood and death passes over. The the plague of the death of the firstborn of Egypt was the reason that Pharaoh finally let his people go. He was defeated. His power was shattered. 
His grip and hold on the people had come to an end. And so it is for us. Christ's death spelled the end of Satan's power over us. The devil has lost his grip and his hold on us. Now we have a way out. Just as Israel came out of Egypt and passed through the water of the Red Sea safely, so we come out of the devil's domain and pass through the waters of holy baptism. God has acted to save us. We have been baptised into Christ and we, he will lead us forward to the promised land, the eternal life in heaven. And on the way, Jesus will lead us and feed us. He will guard us and he will guide us. He will intercede for us and forgive our sins and he will bring us safely to our destination. Moses led Israel to Mount Sinai where the Lord gave his people a way of life, a way of life to live as his holy people. He gave Israel the tabernacle, the place of his dwelling where sinners could come to have their sins forgiven. The pillar of cloud led the way forward on the way to the promised land and the Lord provided manna in the wilderness to feed his people on their way. So also Jesus does for us. We've been given the gift of the Holy Spirit so that we would live as God's holy people, a people set apart to do his will. The Lord has provided the means of grace, word and sacrament, so that our sins will be forgiven when we stumble and fall. Jesus is interceding for us, praying for us, watching over us. He wants us to make it home safely. Jesus feeds us with his very own body and blood to strengthen and nourish us. In faith toward God and in the fervent love towards one another. The Lord's Supper is our way bread to strengthen us on our journey and God's food words guides us on our way and it points us in the right direction. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Do you see, all of what God did in the Exodus for Israel, he does in even a greater way in the Exodus that Jesus accomplishes for us in Jerusalem. Christ goes there to Jerusalem to bring it about. The journey intensifies from this point on, from the time of his transfiguration. For right from this point, Jesus will set his face to go to Jerusalem. That's the Lenten journey we're about to go on to take with Jesus over the next coming weeks. It will take us to Jerusalem, to Holy Week, where and when Jesus will accomplish this amazing exodus. In his death and resurrection, in his ascension and his return to the Father, Jesus accomplishes it, all of it, to lead us out of Egypt and into the promised land. Friends, Jesus is our exodus. He is our way out, the way out of death and sin and the devil's grip. Jesus is our way out, the way to the Father, the way, the truth, and the life. The way leads through the cross, but we know that it leads to glory. And the festival we are celebrating today, the transfiguration of our Lord, shows us that it is indeed God's own Son who is accomplishing this exodus for us. This is my Son, my chosen one. Listen to him. Amen. Our offerings will be collected during the next song. Uh, if you're here, here physically in the chapel, they'll be collected normally. Uh, we're also thankful for those who give electronically each week. And if you'd like to do that but aren't doing that currently, the details may flash briefly on the screen, but they are available in the bulletin, um, so you can keep doing that. Uh, so let's sing Transfiguration. This song is, is a new one. Um, and I like to think of it as an imaginative way of putting ourselves into the situation, if we imagine ourselves up there on the mountain. And this is how the songwriter responded 
to the events of the Transfiguration. So if it's new to you, you'll pick it up really quickly, but we just ask that you enter into it in your hearts and, and as soon as you reckon you've got the hang of it, join in with your voices as well. was veiled now is seen Jesus the image of the invisible God Divinity confirmed in the trap
join with me in praying the offering prayer as we thank God for the gifts that He's given us. Great and glorious God, thank You for revealing Your Son and for showing the light of His glory. Help us to be reflections of His glory as we give of our time, our talents and our possessions to help others. Amen. As we start to prepare for communion, let us confess our sins together before God and each other. Uh, so speak this responsively with me. God of mercy and grace, you come to us in Jesus of Nazareth to break down the dividing walls of hostility between us. Yet we maintain walls that separate and isolate. You give us the ministry of reconciliation yet we nurse our wounds and withhold mercy and forgiveness. You invite us to join with Peter, James and John on the mountain of transfiguration, yet we deny the wonders you have worked in our own lives. You ask us to acknowledge and share our wealth, yet we refuse to recognise and relieve the poverty around us. You bless our lives with boundless love, yet we fail to witness to that love and so keep others from knowing you. Forgive our selfishness, we pray. Transform us by your spirit and your word into that which pleases you, the image of Christ. Amen. Jesus admonished Peter, James, and John, not to tell of what they'd witnessed on the mountain of transfiguration until he was resurrected. But we can tell what we've seen and heard of God's glory. Here is the good news. Jesus lives. He is raised. We are forgiven. So go, share that vision. Tell of God's love. In this, God is well pleased. And now Pastor Lee will lead us in communion. The Lord be with you. We come to this meal with open hands and hearts. We come to this meal needing grace. Let us pray together the Lord's Prayer as Jesus prays this with us and for us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And having given thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after the supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So our communion procedure remains the same as it has been for the past few weeks. So firstly, I'd invite our helpers, our deacons and our stewards to come forward to help prepare for communion. And I'd also invite the band to come forward first to receive communion. And while the stewards and deacons are coming forward, I'd invite you to share the peace of the Lord with your neighbours with a nod or a wave. So as I mentioned, our procedure will be similar to what we've been doing for the past few months. We'll have two communion stations um, at the front of the church.
The stewards will direct you to come forward row by row from the side aisles. Um, you'll receive the bread in a small bag and also individual cups of wine. As you return to your seat by the centre aisle, there'll be some small bins here for your empty bags and cups. Gluten-free wafers are available on request, so please ask the deacons if you prefer those. All the wine is without alcohol. For those children's ministries that are running today, if families with children want to come forward as soon as they're ready. And as Saviour, all those who believe that in this meal they share in the body and blood of Jesus are welcome to join us for communion. So the invitation. Jesus says, my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood remain in me and I in them. All is ready. All are welcome.
the body of our Lord Jesus Christ in his holy and precious blood, strengthen and preserve you in body and soul to eternal life. Go in God's peace. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in the beginning you created light and at the right time you sent your Son to be the true light of the world. Through the gift of his body and blood, shine in our hearts and lives so that we may share in the inheritance of all the saints in light. For Jesus lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We continue in prayer. Thanks, Margaret. I realise that today, too, for all of us, whether we're in this place or people are looking, um, looking and joining with us um, via the camera, and goodness only knows where people are, that we all probably are coming with anxious hearts for a whole lot of reasons. So I ask that we ju we'll just sit quietly for a moment and let God's peace and Holy Spirit speak with us. I will pray a pe prayer for Transfiguration Sunday and I will then conclude with a prayer for Ukraine. So a moment of quiet. Breath of God, breathe on us. Our request for the light of God to shine in our lives brightly and in full force is heard and will be answered. Radiant God, source of light, as you surrounded Jesus with your glory, so you come to us in penetrating the brightness. You catch us off guard and expose our weakness. We choose the limelight, while you call us to explore the shadows and brighten the darkness. We seek the spectacular, while you bind up the broken in countless acts of mercy. We seek to stay on the mountain or in a comfortable pew while you walk to the valleys of need. Radiant God, fill us with light and courage to carry good news into all the corners of the world and to bring back the joy of your presence. Amen. God of peace and justice, we pray for the people of Ukraine today. We pray for peace and the laying down of weapons. We pray for all those who fear for tomorrow, that your spirit of comfort would draw near to them. We pray for those with power over war or peace, for wisdom, discernment and compassion to guide their decisions. Above all, we pray for all your precious children at risk and in fear that you would hold and protect them. We pray in the name of Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Amen. And as we finish up our service, hear these words of blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favour and give you peace. Amen. Let's stand as we sing our final song for this Sunday, Shine, Jesus, Shine. communication issue. Ferris Lord Jesus it is. Mm -hmm. 